I was recalling uh, growing up playing basketball. Thank you, James, for getting me on track. Uh, that's what he's supposed to do. You did a good job with that. Thank you. And so uh, when we, we grew up playing basketball, we played all the time everywhere, but we made the team. And one of the things they worked very hard with us on is just getting us in shape. Uh, they would condition us. We would run for everything. You miss a play, you run. Uh, we run at the beginning of practice, middle of practice, end of practice. All the time running, running line drills, running special drills all the time. And we were running those line drills. Oftentimes, guys would look at each other and go, man, why are we doing this? But I saw Friday night the reason why you do it because I saw some of those players just really struggling to breathe. And they couldn't get up and down the court. And I thought to myself, they just didn't run enough in practice. And, but when you're running in practice and you're running those line drills from the end of the court to the foul line, back to the middle half line, back, down to the other foul line, back, all the way to the end, and back as absolutely as fast as you can. And your coach is uh, timing you. That's what they did for us. And if you didn't get it in a certain amount of time, you got to run again. And we ran and we ran and we ran. But in running all those line drills, you ask yourself the question, why am I doing this? And the coach would remind you so that you can have freedom in the game to run. But oftentimes when you and I go through trials, we ask ourselves, why am I doing this? Why am I going through something that is so hard? Why would God give this to me? Why is this coming to my life? And I think it's a natural question, especially when we feel the pressure. It could be physical. It could be emotional. Uh, it could be a combination of both. But it, whatever it is that defines the trial that comes, it puts us out of kilter, out of our normal routine, and it causes us to feel a certain measure of pain, of uncertainty. And it's in that feeling that we question, why am I going through this? Should I continue to go through this? And what I want you to be able to answer today at the end of the message is simply this. Whatever it is I'm going through, and if you look back in your life and you look at the things you've been through, you can always answer this in hindsight, but it's in the midst that it's hard to answer, and the answer is yes, it is worth it. Whatever God brings my way, I will persevere by the strength that God gives. And there's somebody here today, I feel sure, in the number of people that are listening to this message, they need that type of resolve today to take the next step, to go the distance to run the next line drill so that they can fulfill what God has for them. There is an end goal in it all. Now, we get that when it comes to sports, and we run harder, and we run more, but do we get it spiritually? I can't tell you many people in my lifetime that I have encountered. I wish I would have kept a journal of the number of people who started the race and quit the race at least from my perspective. Now, maybe they're back in the race today, and I just don't know it. But I can't tell you how many people become discouraged. They become tired. And when the trials of life come, they simply conclude that it's just not worth it. Let me do something else. And they leave following Christ, and they go in a different direction. I don't want to do that. I want to run to the end, and I want to be faithful, and I want you to do the same. And we will learn today that the if of, of perseverance under trials, it results in receiving the crown of life that God provides us. And we'll talk about what that crown is, but I want you to know that's the end goal. For every believer is the crown of life, to bring honor and glory to his name, and for him to hear, to hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. But it won't be without facing trials. The Bible's very clear about that. I want you to come to the final conclusion that trials are your friend, not your foe. I want you to see that you should welcome them into your life, not resent them and resist them. I want you to be able to consider them with joy. That's what the text tells us. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. And so we need to learn to do that. Why? Because our faith is being tested. Our patience and perseverance is being developed so we will become mature. And yes, we need the wisdom of God to embrace the trials so that we live by faith and not by doubt. 
And so all those things we've been learning over the last two weeks, but today we're going to learn from verses 9 and 12 to pull it all together is that we have got to get perspective, apply perseverance in order to obtain the promise of God. These are the three directives for persevering. You've got to consider your position, take your stand, and receive the reward. And so let's take a look at those today. Number one, consider your position. This is where we get perspective, verses 9, 10, and 11. And here's what the Scripture says. The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position. But the one who is rich should take pride in his low position because he will pass away like a wildflower. But the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. It's very interesting here that he is giving us several things to consider, two positions, and then he gives an illustration to drive home the point. And he's talking about trials here, holistically in the context. And so, really what he's dealing here with is two very practical things, I think, that are temptations to every human being in one or the other category. And it's just something we should give consideration to. And I think that's what trials do. They cause us to stop and consider our lives. Recently, we've had a chance to um, discard some things out of our attic. Our son took some things when they moved in, and, and we were able to give a table away the other day. And, and, and removing some of those things, I can now walk in the attic and actually kind of see what kind of space is there and see what's left. Anybody want anything? I'll be glad to bring it to you, whatever's in there. But you consider when things push you in a direction, and those things pushed us to deal with that, now I can consider what's going on in there. And that's what trials do. They help us consider our lives. Slow down enough to consider your life. Slow down enough to consider, listen, what we're going to see in these two positions is what really matters in life. And every time I've ever slowed down enough to consider what really matters in life, here's what it does for me. It recenters me on what I ought to be doing. It calls me back to a dependence on Christ. And that's not a bad thing. It calls me back to the Word. It calls me back to prayer. It calls me to recenter my life and trust in God. This is the definition of the building of my faith, right? This is the definition of becoming mature and complete, right? So trials aren't a bad thing, and God knows what we need, and He knows what He wants to put us through for His glory, and it's not a bad thing. It is a good thing. And so He gives us two positions to give consideration to. One is in the area of poverty, and the other is in the area of plenty. Now, Neither of these are right or wrong. They both just simply need proper perspective. So let's address the position of poverty first. So he says, right here, he says, The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position. Now, what we have to understand here is that the humble circumstances are low is a word that can be used instead of humble. It's not talking about your spiritual condition here, but your earthly status. We all have a certain status in essence based on uh, the things that we own, uh, the places uh, that we go, uh, the positions that we hold. And whether we like it or not, men put us in a status uh, in this earth and, and in the world in which we live, right? And if you find yourself in a humble circumstance, one that is low, meaning you're not as wealthy as another, that's okay. That's not right. That's not wrong. It just is where God has you at this point in your life. You remember the mother of Mary, she spoke about how God lifts up those who are in humble and low circumstances and he uses them for his glory. That's not a bad thing. She was in that position and God chose to use her, that godly woman that she was, right? So this is not a negative thing, it just is, right? 
And so if you're in that state, what you need to do is to take pride. Take pride simply means to rejoice or to have glory in. And this inward joy is also expressed outwardly. It's a through and through type of joy that is not altered by anything. Not your position, not somebody's perspective of you. This is an inner joy that you are to have concerning the position in life that you're in. You're in these humble circumstances. You are to take pride, and you should ask yourself the question, what am I taking pride in? He said to take pride in your high position. Now we're speaking about something that is spiritual. We're speaking about your spiritual position as a Christian. Okay? And so who you are in Christ is what it's talking about. I knew a man in my church when I served as a student minister at Harbor Baptist Church in Texas. And his name was Oscar Worley. Wonderful man. He's with the Lord now. But this man was uh, a man that could not read. He couldn't read a single word. He could not write because he could not read. But he was not ignorant. He was a very smart man. And one of the things that made him so incredibly smart and wise is that he would always listen to the Word of God on cassette tapes. This was back before anything was digital. And he would listen, and he would listen, and he would listen to the Word. There's no telling how many times he listened to the Word in a year. But you would go and talk to him. I love to go to his house, sit out in his front yard in a chair and just talk to him. Because he was so filled with joy. He had this type of joy where he took pride and rejoiced and had this overflowing understanding and joy of who he was in Christ. I bet you that he didn't have $10 in his bank account probably. I don't know. But he obviously was not a man of incredible earthly wealth. But the wealth that was in his heart overflowed to the point that you could not convince him that he was not rich. He was so rich in the Lord, nothing else mattered. And he was a beautiful picture of this. And this is really what this is talking about, is that when we come to an understanding of who we are, it changes everything. Tom Crane shared in our men's time together, the breakfast time this morning, as he shared testimony, and he was just really trying to get us to stop and realize what the Lord's done for us. And whosoever calls on his name, and he changes your life, don't ever forget it. And this is what they're really trying to drive home here is, if you are in a low and humble state, do not forget what the Lord has done for you. Oftentimes, when we become discouraged, now this is very important, I'm telling you, because we struggle here. We, we go through a very difficult time, whatever the trial may be, and we began to look for relief. We began to look for direction. We began to look for a way out to understand what is going on. And I really believe that it's we either turn to the Lord and we celebrate who we are in Christ, or we turn to what the world has to offer. And oftentimes, the greatest temptation that we turn to is that we begin to compare our situation to other people's situation. And the real thing here is we begin to say, man, if I just had what so-and-so has, if I had had their opportunity, if I had their bank account, if I had their influence, if I had their talent, then I, then, then I wouldn't be in the position that I'm in. You see the temptation there? And the world gives a steady diet of come make more money. Uh, get yourself in shape and be respected by other people. I mean the ads are everywhere. The call to do it the way of the world is constantly beckoning you to trust the ways of the world. But I want to say to you, you can go and amass as much wealth as you want. But if your focus is on the wealth, you're going to miss what it's all about. It's about what Christ has done in us. That's the only thing that solves this quandary in the heart of man is Christ because he is called to live right here in our hearts. And if we don't keep that central, if we don't keep that right, if we don't joy in that, have this overwhelming joy that's internally and externally exuding from us because of our high position in Christ, 
We will always be discontent. We will always be discouraged. And in the midst of the trials, we will lose hope. If you came to me and you said, man, I'm so discouraged in the midst of my trial, I don't know what to do. If I was to write you a pres spiritual prescription, and I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go sit down. I want you to take a piece of paper and a pen and your Bible, and I want you to spend at least five hours, no interruptions. Leave your cell phone somewhere else, and I want you just to write down everything that God's ever done for you. And if you're a genuine believer, your life has been changed genuinely changed you would start there this is how God drew me into his love this is how he demonstrated his love for me and that Christ died for me here's how I accepted Christ here's my understanding of who I am in Christ here are all the answered prayers God has done for me and you began to write all, all that write it all down and when you get a, a whole sheet of paper full of the activity of God towards you and changing you and you begin to realize man Money couldn't buy that change. My friends couldn't do that for me. This is what God's done for me and in me. Man, I am rich, spiritually speaking, right? And you began to joy in that. I'll tell you this. It'll change your perspective. It'll get you out of your discouragement. It'll give you what you need to go through the trial, whatever it is, because you will have the proper perspective. That's what they're trying to say here is that you've got to understand your value in Christ. The poor man is not to be discouraged or depressed by his poverty, but is to rejoice or have glory in his high spiritual position. John Adams said these words. My wife will like this. She likes history. He said this, talking about the believer. He said, he has the features and feelings as well as the standing and rights of a son. He is a new creature in Christ Jesus, a bearer of divine image, a partaker of the divine nature. He has inexhaustible treasures at his disposal, a provision adequate to every possible want and need of his condition, if not the actual possession of, at least a sure title to. Whatever can minister to his safety and happiness, he is the heir of a portion in comparison which all the estates and dignities of earth are not worthy to be named. He is an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away. Man, that's a mouthful, is it not? Did you get all that? Who you are in Christ is so rich, so overwhelmingly incredible, it's kind of hard to get your mind around it, honestly. But when you do, you're not going to focus on your humble circumstances or your poverty, nor are you going to be tempted by wealth. That's the position of poverty. But now what about the position of prosperity? Wealth. What an interesting topic this is. Wealth has the ability, and may I say to you, there's nothing evil or wrong with wealth. Let's be clear about that. Abraham was one of the wealthiest men that ever lived in the world. But he was a man of faith, and he loved God, and he used it for God's glory. There are many wealthy people in the Scriptures, but there's a lot of warning about wealth as, as well. Wealth has this ability to create a false sense of reality. See, the rich man here is not to delight in his worldly goods, but is to rejoice or glory in the humbling of his soul by divine grace. You say, what does that mean? It means that if you're wealthy, you have resources. The temptation is, in the midst of the trial, is to look to those resources. It is to say, well, I can write a check, or well, I have a way I can get myself out of this, or well, I will satisfy my soul with the things that I can buy or the places that I can go, the things that I want, that's the temptation if you have resources at hand. If you're in poverty, you don't have those. But if you have wealth, those are available to you. And so what he is saying here is, if you are in this position of wealth, what you need to remind yourself of is this. You're very human. You, you will die. Your wealth is a false security 
to what really matters in life. That's what he's getting at. Now, this is something that we all need to be reminded of. This is something we must take to heart, that we don't focus on finances instead of focusing on our faith in the midst of a trial. We are the rich person, the wealthy person, is to take pride. That is, once again, to rejoice and glory in what? That is our low position. That means that we are to focus on the very fact that you and I are human, and we will pass away. And we are not gods unto ourselves with the wealth that God has entrusted to us. And we must not do as we please with the wealth that we have. We must look to the Lord. Okay? Um, let me read some scripture to you. In 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19, it says this. And this is um, Paul writing to Timothy about what Timothy is to say to the church. And he says this, command those... This is a command, and I am to uh, reiterate this as well to you as God's people. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth. That's it right there. Don't put your hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. But to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so they may take hold of the life that is truly life. See, when you have resources and wealth, there is the potentiality that you would trust in that instead of God that you would miss what really matters in life. God says, no, you use it for my glory. There's nothing wrong with being rich, but you need to first seek me so that I can lead you how to take these resources because you're going to give an account one day for the resources that I have entrusted to you. That day is going to come. You're going to have to give an account. And we've got to remember this. You know, I... Um, you know, I make a lot of hospital visits, and there's some that stick with me, and some I've probably forgotten of situations, and maybe the Lord can bring those back to me. But I remember very distinctly uh, visiting my friend, David Wilson, in the hospital. Uh, he was right back here, just a few blocks back, and one night on a Wednesday night, I, w I ran over just to see him uh, before church started. Or maybe I just went, I think, no, actually I went during church. I just said, I'm, I just feel like a need. I need to go over there. And I just spent the evening with him. As I sat there with him at his bedside, I began to just talk to him. And he was doing his best to talk to me. He didn't feel great. And uh, we had a close enough relationship, though, that he didn't mind that I was in the room with him, even though he was struggling. Uh, and we just began to talk. And I said, David, I'm praying for you. He goes, well, I appreciate that. And I said, how was your day? And we talked about that. And. And then we just sat there in silence for a little while. And then he spoke. And he said something that I'll always remember. He said, Mark, he said, he said, this may be it. I said, what do you mean, David? He said, this, this may be it. God may be calling me home. And I'm going to have to give an account for my life. This may be it. I said, no, David, come on. We're, we're praying that you're going to get better. And he looked at me and he goes, no, I think this is it. And this was probably, I don't know, three or four months prior to his passing. I'm guessing at that time frame. But what I saw in his eyes, what I heard from his heart, was the realization, I'm going to give an account. And I'm preparing myself to give an account to God. I believe he's calling me home. And we began to talk about that. Now, the reason I bring that up is this, and I think about it often, because my time's going to come, and I'm going to say, it's time. I may die in a car accident, and I may not have a chance to say that, or I may have a prolonged illness that allows me to prepare to know it's coming. I don't know. But here's what I know is that for every one of us, we will give an account. 
And one of the things he's trying to say to those who had so many resources is this. Listen, you're going to give an account. You're not going to live forever. And if you can take this to heart, it will help you get through this trial and not depend on your resources. You'll depend on me. And that's what God wants. That's what he's trying to say to those who have the, the wealth. we got to realize the brevity of life. And that's what he's trying to get across. The sun rises. Scorching heat comes. The plant withers. And the blossom falls. This is his illustration. Now I know from time to time we've gone on vacation in the summertime. And those times that we have forgotten to ask somebody to come and water the flowers at the house. We have, I don't know, seven or eight um, pots spread around the front and backyard. Let me just tell you what happens in the Augusta 110 heat. The sun rises every day while we're gone. The scorching heat comes down on those flowers. The plant withers. The blossom falls. And we get home and they are dead. And if you've forgotten to water your plants in the summer, I promise you that's what's happened for your plants here in Augusta. And it is a vivid illustration that that is what happens to us. Now the problem is, if we have wealth, we have a confidence that I can do what I want. If I, if I have resources, I can get through this. And, and, and I'm going to keep going as though I'm never going to seek the Lord or the realization I'm going to live in such a way that I'm going to give an account one day. That's the danger. We should live every day as though this is the day we will give an account. Turn with me over to Proverbs chapter 22, if you would. I just want to read a few scriptures, uh, two in Proverbs and then one over in 1 Peter, just to note these truths. In uh, Proverbs chapter 22, and then we'll look in 23, right at the beginning, I've always been drawn to these verses here. In Proverbs 22, verse 1, it says, A good name is more desirable than great riches. Isn't that nice? To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. Rich and poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. Aren't those good truths to remind ourselves? Look at 23, 4. It says this, Do not wear yourself out to get rich. Have wisdom to show restraint. Cast but a glance at riches, and they are gone. For they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. Next time you see an eagle in the sky, you probably don't see those very often around here, but next time you see a hawk or a buzzard, anything that you see flying, you think about that that's what your riches can do. They can sprout wings and fly off. And boy, do they. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1 if you would, and I want to read this to you. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 24 and 25 is another emphasis on this truth. And he says, chapter 1 verse 24 and 25 of 1 Peter, he says, All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers. The flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. How many of you guys have a, a, a yard that has grass in it? How many of you walk in that yard? Every time you walk in that yard, I want you to think about the fact that that represents you and me. <laughs> that we are going to die one day, and we're going to stand before the Lord, and we are going to give an account. It's such a great reminder. We must not forget it is our faith that is being tested. That's what's being developed. So it's my faith that's being tested. I don't want to wallow in my poverty and go, oh, if I had what somebody else had, and see that as my hope. And if I have resources, I don't want to look to my resources to deliver me. I want my faith to be tested. I want to grow in my faith. I want to delight in the work of God, and I want to stay under the trial and not look like compare myself for a better situation or look to my resources and miss what God's doing. That's really what he's saying here. Instead, what we are to do, secondly, is to take your stand. This is where the 
perseverance comes in. And he says in verse 12, he says, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Because when he has stood the test, you got to persevere. In order to do that, you gotta, you've got to take your stand. You, you've got to face it. Have you ever felt like giving up? I have. Probably everybody in the room could say yes. <laughs> and yet maybe more often than not, you just want to give up. Don't. It's okay to want to give up long as you don't. I was told that as a very young man, and I believe it's true. It's okay to have those feelings as long as you don't act on them. And they're real. Instead, we are to persevere, stand strong. They stood the test. The TEV says, succeed in passing the test. The NIV says, stood the test. The KJV says, they're tried. The New King James Version says, when he has been approved. I kind of like that version because that word approved is a word that was used of metals and coins which had to be tested to find out if they were real and true. It was another way, it's just another way of expressing endurance. Like, that coin is real. It's, it's the real thing. It, it stood the test. It's, it's approved. And when we go through the trials we go through, and as we trust the Lord and He gives us the strength, we are, listen, we are approved that we are His. We don't cut and run. We don't hide. We don't say it's not worth it. We have the perseverance of the saints to go through whatever it is that God says we are to go through for Him. We stand the test. And in standing, guess what comes? Maturity. Maturity is the goal. You can't download maturity off the internet. Not spiritual maturity. You can't pick it up through a drive through You can't have somebody say, I'm going to leave you in my inheritance spiritual maturity. And it doesn't happen that way. Spiritual maturity comes in trusting God through whatever it is He leads us to go through. And His yoke is well-fitting and it's light when we get up under it. I want you to turn with me over to Hebrews chapter 12. And this is such a beautiful picture, an important principle. The first three verses, and many of us know these verses quite well, but I want to point out one thing in verse 2. And let me read these if I may. Hebrews 12, the first three verses, talking about Jesus our Savior and what He went through for our salvation. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Boy, that's a good word, right? Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And this is the part, if you could underline this, if it's not already underlined in your Bible, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Now let me just finish and I'll come back and speak to that. Scorning his shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him and endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. That last verse where it says we are to consider him who endured, that word endured, uh, if you'll connect that back to verse 2, as we consider how he endured the opposition from sinful men, then you and I won't grow weary and lose heart. You see that? Okay? Now here's what I want you to see, is that his endurance was possible because of the joy set before him. This has been entitled by many people, The Future Joy That Fuels Our Thankful Endurance. What it simply means is this, is that he had the ability to put his eyes on the future joy in the midst of the pain, the carrying of our sin, the humiliation that came, the cursing that came, the accusations that came, the brutal beating that came. All that came with the crucifixion, the whole deal, in the midst, all that heaviness, all that spiritual responsibility, all that he would do in shedding his blood, all that that's going on. Here's what you've got to remember. Jesus had the ability to see into the future and saw the joy that was to come, meaning that what he saw down here was Mark would be saved. What he saw down here was Evan would be saved. What he saw down here was everyone who could be redeemed and whosoever calls on the name of the Lord would be saved. And that is what 
was in his heart. And so in the midst of all that was going on, he could see the joy of the souls saved for eternity. And it gave him the strength to endure the cross. Now why is this important? It is so vitally important because in the midst of whatever trial comes our way, we are to see into the future the purposes of God. And we are to stand strong. We are to be approved like a coin that is real. We are to carry forward. Or we can leave. <laughs> we can cut and run. We can hide. We can say, this don't feel good. I don't deserve this. I'm an American. Nobody treats me like this. What? You're a Christian. You may have rights as an American citizen, but you are a Christian. And if God places you where he places you, and what comes, comes your way for his glory, he will give you the strength to see to the other side of this and endure whatever it is you're going through. And oftentimes, our emotions rile us up. Oftentimes, other people's perspectives rile us up. And we take our eyes off of the truth of Jesus Christ. And we're not praying. We're not in the Word. We lose heart. We become tired. The pain is real. And we think to ourselves, is it worth it? I'll tell you the only way you get perspective to know it's worth it, whatever the trial is that you're going through, is you've got to see the joy that is to come in walking through your obedience and knowing that God will sustain you and that this is the persevering that brings the maturity and the completeness that God says, I need. And that may be the most humbling part of it. When I go through something hard, I have to realize, okay, I'm obviously very immature. I am very uh, not complete. <laughs> Because God's still working on me. But here's what I've come to realize is, I think it's going to be like that all the way to the end. And I just got to be okay with it. And when I look back, I, I see that God has brought me, every time he's brought me through. And the emotional pain, he gives me perspective. Physical pain, he gives me perspective. I don't understand why people do what they do. He says, that's okay. And somehow, my heart is just warmed. It's comforted by that truth, and I keep stepping forward in the joy of the Lord, knowing that it's going to be okay. That's endurance. That's persevering. That's moving forward. That results in, number three, receiving your reward. I'm not there yet fully. Now, some scholars believe that when you read this verse, it's talking about the fullness of life now and to come. I don't fully understand all of that. I believe that's true, that the Lord meets our needs where we are, and it is a full life. It is an abundant life, John 10, 10, and it is eternal life to come. Yes, it's both of those things, but the crown of life will come that God has promised to those who love him. It's been noted that you begin with joy and you end with joy. The blessed joy that comes, the crown of life. The crown is a gift symbolizing divine approval of a life tested by trials for the one who endures. I think it's the call on every Christian's life to endure. I don't think anybody gets a pass, the easy pass. Come to Christ, here's your easy pass. You're never going to struggle. You're never going to have to pray. You're never going to feel pain. No one's ever going to reject you. You're never going to have to deal with sin. Excuse me, what kind of Bible are you reading? That's not, that's not real. No. We all go through it. That, that's just the truth of the matter. If you're going to really live the truth, you're going to face some stuff. You say, well, how do I know I'm going to get the crown of life? The only thing I know to say to you is that God promised it. And his promises, he holds to them. That's how I know. It's based on the promises of God. And then you can be assured it is the love of God that leads to this perseverance that allows us to love him as he has loved us through the whole deal. When I become a double-minded person and I ask for wisdom and I want it but I don't want it and I'm sure maybe that he has something I need but I'm not sure I really believe it and I'm back and I'm forth. I'm not really loving, trusting fully in God. But when I do have that faith, it is a picture of complete love, complete love. It's a testimony of God's love for me and my love for him. This whole deal 
Verses 2 through 12 is a word of encouragement and hope for the believer. Not to give up. Not to give up in the midst of trials. But to bear up under those trials. Listen, parents. You should take this and you should teach your children how to bear up under the trials. When they come home from school and they've had a hard day and somebody's rejected them or they didn't, a test didn't work out the way they wanted or, or they're, all, you know, they're just down emotionally and you're going to get all of those things as parents, you, you teach them to seek the Lord and let God fill them. Please don't make the mistake of making it okay for them. Not that you're not supposed to be there for them, you are. But if you can teach them to look to the Lord and let God give them perspective, give them peace in their hearts, they will have a gift that will take them through a lifetime of things that will come to them that they cannot explain, that they're going to have to trust to God. And if they can learn it early on, oh, what a gift. Oh, what a gift. Don't become a victim. Don't become a person that lives in their feelings. Become a person that is growing up to spiritual maturity and completeness by trusting God through the hard things. Let God do his work in you. Trials are not designed to break us, but to build us. You can write that down. We should not run from the trials, but remain up under the trials. And when we do, we move from exposure to truth to experiencing truth. We begin to live the truth. And that's when it gets really powerful. That's when it gets real. That's when the peace comes and the joy um, comes inside of us and exudes out of us. And we take pride in the fact that we have a high position in Christ. And it's a beautiful thing. Because the development of our inward character, our faith in him, is taking place. One last scripture that I'll close with in a story. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11, if you would. Just back to the left there, just a couple of pages. Hebrews 11. And I want to read verses 24, 25, and 26. And I want you to catch this principle. It says in verse 24, by faith Moses, when he had grown up, he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be what? Mistreated. He chose it. Now that doesn't feel good, does it? No. Along with the people of God, Rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time, he regarded disgrace, that doesn't feel good, for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt. See, the rich man may look to his wealth and think that'll take care of it. No, 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 no. Remember your low position. Remember you're going to give an account. Remember that for the sake of Christ, this is of greater value than any wealth we can have, even the treasures of Egypt. Because he was what? Here it is. What? What was he doing? He was looking ahead to his reward. What's down here? You know what's down here? The crown of life. Now, I want to ask you, in the midst of your trial, are you looking ahead to your reward? Or are you looking in at your feelings? Are you looking ahead at the crown of life that is to come as you persevere and you endure? Or are you worried about what people think about you? I'm telling you, it's a real battle. And if you're, you're in a humble state, you may think, well, maybe if I was this person. If you've got great wealth, you may say, well, I'm going to buy my way out of this or this will satisfy my soul. It won't. You've got to let the Lord fill you up and you've got to look to your reward and you've got to walk in faithfulness and He's the one that takes you through. I remember... As a child, a child, a young teenager, we used to go up all the time and uh, where I lived in Virginia, and we would go up to uh, the Peaks of Otter. We got a few folks in here probably that know that area. Uh, the Jessies are from Roanoke. They probably know right where this is. Probably been there many times. But we go up to the Peaks of Otter and hike it. I, I, can't, I don't know how many times I've hiked that. It's a mile and a half to the top, to what they call sharp top. And as kids, we used to hike that thing. We'd take field trips up there. We'd go back as a family and friends, and we'd hike that thing. And we'd hike it. We'd run up it. It was always a competition to see how fast you could go a mile and a half straight up a mountain. And it was great. And one day we were going up that thing, and I used to love to do it. And some friends of mine stopped me about halfway and said, what are we doing? This is terrible. They couldn't breathe, and they're, ah, what, why are we going up this thing like this? I said, it's the view. It's worth it. 
They're like, I don't know, this feels terrible. I'm about to have a heart attack. I'm telling you guys, when you get to the top, it is worth it. See, and the reason I'm telling you that story is, I could see ahead and I wanted that view. And I wanted to go to the other side so I could get up there and it's, and it's just beautiful. It's just beautiful. I loved it. And I'd say, it's the view. And they'd be huffing and they'd be puffing. And they'd say, what is that noise? I said, what noise? What is that noise? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the bus that takes people three-fourths of the way up. And they're like, what? We can rent the bus? <laughs> Don't worry about that. Come on, guys. We can do this thing, right? Here's the problem. Too many of us, when we go through a trial, we just want the bus to come pick us up. And take us three-fourths of the way. God, we'll do the last fourth for you. You know what God says? Hike the whole mountain. Put your eye at the top. Look at the reward. Trust me, I'm going to make you mature and complete as you go through this. Listen, I, I need this every week of my life. How about you? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. How about you? Let's go to the Lord in prayer.